in the Buddha's description of right mindfulness, he's telling us how to get the mind into right concentration. And the formula is this. You keep focused on the body in and of itself, ardent, alert, and mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. That's two activities, keeping focused on, say, the breath in and of itself, and putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. That's the second activity. And then you bring three qualities. You're mindful, you're alert, you're ardent. Staying with the breath, just simply on its own terms. How it feels as it comes in, how it feels as it goes out, without thinking about anything else related to it. Just right here. And a good way to stick with that is to make the breath interesting. And it's interesting because of the questions you ask. What kind of breathing would feel good? What kind of breathing would feel really nourishing? What kind of breathing does the body need right now? If you're feeling tense, try to breathe in a way that's relaxing. If you're feeling tired, try to breathe in a way that gives you more energy. If there are pains in different parts of the body, try to create a sense of well-being in another part of the body, and then see if you can let that sense of well-being spread from your comfortable spot through the pain and out beyond to dissolve away any tension you may have built up around the pain. In other words, learn how to use the breath. And John Fung had a number of students who, after he passed away, stuck with the meditation. There were a number of students who didn't. And I noticed that most of the ones who did stick with it had particular pains, particular illnesses, and they had seen the benefits that come from using the breath to help them deal with the illness and help them deal with the pain. So when you can see that the breath is useful, then it's a lot easier to stick with it in and of itself and not veer off to other other preoccupations. So you're mindful, you keep the breath in mind, you're alert, you're watching what's going on, and you're ardent. You try to do this well, which means that if you do shift off to other things, that's what the second activity is for. You put aside greed and distress with reference to the world. Any thoughts having to do with the world, even you in the world, you want to put aside. And due to that, you have to make the world uninteresting. Now, for most of us, all of our interest in life has to do with stories around the world, things we want out of it, things that have happened in the past, things that, memories that are hurtful. The mind likes to go over those in the same way they might pick at a scab on a wound. And you have to learn how to make those stories uninteresting. This is especially difficult in stories where you were a victim and you still want to have justice done. That's probably the strongest sense of self there is. But you have to realize it's not wanted right now. Because the way you dig up those old stories, it's like taking a knife and then stabbing yourself with it. Maybe the other person gave you the knife or stabbed you the first time, but then you pick it up and stab yourself again and again and again. It's not helpful. So one way of making the world uninteresting is to think in the Buddhist terms. Remember on the night of his awakening, his first knowledge had to do with memories of past lives. You think you have stories. The Buddha had thousands and thousands of them. He remembered where he had been born, what he looked like, what he was his experiences of pleasure and pain, what his food was, and how he died. That was it. Pleasure, pain, food, death. They're coming back again, and then again, and again. So he didn't go straight from that knowledge to the knowledge of his awakening. 
he went through the knowledge of seeing all beings in the universe dying and being reborn in line with their actions. This showed him, one, that there was a pattern. Because when you take one person many lifetimes, all too often there doesn't seem to be much of a pattern. Sometimes you do good in this lifetime and you go to a bad destination afterwards because your mind has fallen in the meantime. Or you do something bad, but then your mind rises to a better stage. And so you go to a good place. It might seem like karma doesn't have any effect, but when you see the long-term results, you see them spread out over many, many beings, you realize that's what drives the universe. It's our actions. And it just keeps going on and on and on. He said, you cannot even conceive of a beginning point. It's been going on that long, Malta. Tears you've shed over these many, many lifetimes, greater than the water in the ocean. And that's just <clears throat> excuse me, tears over the loss of a mother. Tears of, from the loss of a father are also more than the tears in the ocean. Loss of a brother, a sister, a child. Each case more than the water in the ocean. It's been going on for that long. We saw how immense the whole issue was and how immense all these many, many stories were. The individual stories begin to lose a lot of their meaning and interest. It was from that perspective that he moved into the present moment and focused on what was going on in his mind right here, right now. And that was how he gained awakening. So you notice the pattern. Instead of going straight from the narratives back to the present moment, he stopped for a minute to think about how huge the universe was and how long these stories have been going on and how many different roles you've had. As you said, it'd be hard to find someone who hasn't been your mother and your father and your brother and your sister and your child, your son and your daughter. We've switched roles that many times. And sometimes we've been on the good side, sometimes we've been on the bad side. It's back and forth. There's a story in the commentary of these two women come running in to see the Buddha one time. The first one is holding a child. She's being chased by the second woman who's trying to kill the child. And they get to the Buddha. The first woman has gone to the Buddha for protection. And so he talks to them about their many lifetimes. So in one case, uh, there was a major wife who had no children, and then a minor wife had a child, and the major wife was jealous, afraid that she would lose her power, so she killed the child of the minor wife. The minor wife swore revenge. So in the following lifetime, the minor wife, <coughs> excuse me, the minor wife was born as a fox. The major wife was born as a chicken. The fox ate the chicks of the chicken. So the chicken swore revenge. And it kept going on and on and on, to the point where you're forgetting who was who. And the whole point of this is to see how meaningless it is to get worked up about a particular issue. That way you've been wrong to where you've wronged somebody. Because these stories have been going on for so long. You, guess you develop a sense of dispassion for the story. You spread goodwill for everybody, everybody involved. Goodwill for yourself, goodwill for the other people. Goodwill doesn't mean that you're hoping to continue the story. So it basically means, may you be happy. And you realize that each person's happiness is going to depend on his or her own actions. So it's this combination of seeing the process of rebirth and karma and having goodwill for everybody but goodwill that leads eventually to a sense of equanimity, realizing we don't want to continue these stories. That's the Buddha's universal narrative solvent. For painful memories. So if you find your mind veering off in that direction, Try to look at the narrative in this much larger context. Instead of, you know, he did this or she did this and then I did that and then it goes back and forth. Just think, okay, it's being living beings taking on many different roles as they go from life to life. 
looking for happiness, but in an ignorant way, harming themselves, harming others. And when you see how long this has been going on and how huge the process is, how many beings there are, it gives rise to a sense of dispassion. And that's why you can make greed and distress with reference to the world uninteresting. You get back to the breath. Because as you focus on the breath, you're not learning only about the breath. You're also learning about your mind. And this is where it gets really interesting. You begin to see how your mind shapes your experience right now. When the Buddha talks about the breath, it's not simply watching the breath coming in and going out. He says you try to breathe in and out, aware of what he calls bodily fabrication. Breathe in and out, aware of mental fabrication. Bodily fabrication is the breath and its effect on the body. Mental fabrication deals with your perceptions and your feelings. Those shape your mind. And as you're trying to stay with the breath, keep it in mind, you realize you have to use certain perceptions, and you're trying to generate certain feelings, and they'll have an impact on the mind. And the way you think about the breath will determine how you experience the breath. The way you breathe will have an impact on the mind. It goes back and forth like this. And you begin to ask yourself, what am I doing in this process of fabrication? There's verbal fabrication as well as when you, like when you tell yourself to focus here, focus there. This breath is comfortable, that breath is not comfortable, how can I make it better? There's that kind of fabrication going on as well. And you begin to realize you're shaping the present moment. You've been doing it all along. And there's a way to do it better. That should be fascinating. To realize that you have this power and you can develop this skill. At the same time, realizing if you don't develop the skill, you're just going to keep on suffering. And the suffering would end easily. So on the one hand, you try to make the breath interesting, you try to make the world uninteresting. And you do this with mindfulness, alertness, and you try to do it well. And that's how you can use this exercise in staying with the breath as your frame of reference to start digging down into your mind, developing new skills inside. When you see the benefits of this exercise, then you begin to realize it's, something, it's a skill you want to maintain, a skill you want to keep with you, take with you when you go home, and you want to keep at it, because it's all about the problems in your mind and how you can solve them. And once you've solved the problems in your own mind, then nothing in the world can have an impact on the mind. So the real work is right here. This is why we take this as our frame of reference and put aside greed and distress with reference to the world, because the problem lies in here. You can see the problem in action. You can also work on the solution right at this spot where the, the body and the mind meet at the breath, right here, right now. So this is the frame of reference for solving the problem, for seeing the problem, understanding it, and getting beyond it.